All right. I think I'm live. I think we're good. Let me know everyone if I am not. You guys can probably tell me easier than I can if I am not. Uh, if the audio is bad, obviously try and let me know that as well. Audio is good. Good. All right. Um, so I didn't have a, a major topic that I was going to cover uh, today. I was going to talk through a few things uh, in general and then kind of just ask some questions or if you guys had any questions for me, obviously, uh, let me know. Um, but I want to talk through a few of the things that I've been um, up to, some of the things that uh, is going to go on with the channel um, and some of the things that are behind me. And then I figured people would ask a couple questions. I had a few people in comments that asked um, about watchmaking tools, stuff like that. I've considered making a few videos about that, but uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, uh, I've had a few people ask me about tools in general as well. Happy to talk through that. Um, but for the collection side of things, for some of the things that uh, I'm looking at this year, uh, I'm planning to talk through a few of, yeah, I know I have far too much. Uh, my wife got me these things uh, for Christmas. And so I've, I've definitely got too much Patagonia these days, uh, especially when I wear them together. But uh, from the collection standpoint, I think um, I have a few things that I'm going to try and feature, a few things I'm going to try and get uh, in for review. This year, I want to focus on trying to do some of, uh, some of the um, watches as they come out too. So I've got a few uh, jewelers nearby that I want to try and hopefully work with this year and be able to get access to watches as they come out, especially here in March and April um, when they start to be released. I've got um, behind me a couple watches that I'm going to um, feature soon that most people have already uh, talked about because I'm late to a lot of these things. Having only started this uh, channel last year, um, I was late to a lot of watches, but one of those is going to be the Tissot PRX, which everyone knows um, all about the PRX family. This is the 35 millimeter, and then I got the 40 millimeters, the 40 millimeter PRX also right here. Um, so I'm going to want to do basically size differentials between those two things that I like about them, uh, things that I don't like um, on the size wearing. And then I also have this one that I'm going to do a review here probably in the next, I don't know, three weeks or so. And that is the Santos de Cartier. Um, this was one that I've been liking for a while and looking at for a while. Um, but Hadn't really covered it on the channel or gotten it in for review until now, mostly because um, I was worried about uh, it scratching too much. So the Pasha, Cartier Pasha, have I tried it? Um, I would have to look at it. Um, I got to say, I am not nearly as versed in the Cartier catalog as I am in... Um, a lot of the sports washes. So let me look at it real quick. I think I probably, yeah, I have seen this model before. I have never tried one on, so I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know how it wears um, off the top of my head. I really only tried the tank models. So from the Frances to the Solo, um, my... Uh, mother has a solo. My wife has a Frances. So clearly Cartier is popular, um, but I have not tried on that specific model. And one of my good friends has a um, the Roadster and he really enjoys that. So, but um, I haven't really tried very many Cartier things just because dress watches are not my thing. I, it's not kind of, you know, mainly what I wear on a day-to-day -day basis, a little too loud for what I do for a living. So um kind of interested in how it wears. Uh, I like a lot of things about it, especially if you guys have already researched this watch, the um, the link, the way their, their links are joined on is actually pretty ingenious. I don't know if I'll be able to catch this on the webcam. I'll catch it in the review, but on the webcam, you might be able to see there are these buttons down here. You can kind of see it on this one right here. See how it's like that oval shape? So that little oval shape, you you press in, it's a button. 
um, but it's it's brush finished the same way, so you can't really see the button. But when you click it, then the um, the actual pin ejects, and so then you can pull on the pin, and then the link comes out. So it's really cool. Um, I might be able to get. So that one just popped out, and then I can pull on this link, so that the link, once I pull it out enough, then I can immediately adjust the bracelet size, which it's pretty cool. I mean, for an original, I like for the first time you size it, it's pretty nice. Um, it's a little gimmicky beyond that only because I don't know how many times I'm not going to carry extra links with me to like place in there. Uh, when I feel like, you know, I wanted someone to try it on or my wrist swells or something. So that's a little gimmicky, but I think it's cool in general that they put that design in there. And then from the bracelet strap change, I thought they have the same technology, which I think is actually pretty neat as well. Um, so interested in talking about this. I've got a couple other things coming in as well for review that I want to talk through. I have a few watches that I also borrowed um, for uh, from Moyer um, that I want to review and talk about as well. The size. Um, yeah, so the size is actually interesting. So this is the medium model. Um, there is also obviously the large model. That's typically what most men have picked. I don't think they have a small one, but, um, between the medium and the large, I tried on both, I think originally with my wife and I thought the medium fit better. Uh, having tried the medium now, I do think this is the right fit for me. I think for most men, they're probably going to pick the large model. I, I think it's a great size. I just, I know that most men like larger watches. Um, and this does feel even smaller on the wrist in terms of like uh, wrist presence than my 39 millimeter Pelagos. Like it still feels smaller than that. So like, for example, again, I am trying to do my best here on a webcam, but that's what it looks like. And the face size between these two, you can see that the face is somewhat similar, but this feels a little smaller in person and that's 39 millimeters. And that's still a size that a lot of men think is too small. So uh, needless to say, I think most men will go for the large, but I like the medium. Try to answer your question relatively quickly. Uh, and then I also finally got a moon swatch in. So I figured this live, I would mainly just go through some of the things I'm planning on reviewing. And then if you have questions, you can obviously send them to me, email them to me, or um, you can just let me know on Instagram. Hey, I've got a couple questions. Can you talk about those in your review? Happy to do it. More questions I have, the more information I can use for the review. So this is um, the Moon Swatch. This is the Mission to Jupiter um, version. I like the taupe look. I put it on a Bond NATO strap, which I actually really hate on it. Uh, I put it on there just to put it on something other than the original strap because the original strap was garbage. And I did not like it at all, uh, but I put it on that bond and, and it looks terrible, but the NATO is okay. That's change pace. So I figured I'd try that out, see what it looked like. Um, and then the other things I want to like cover on the channel is some of this stuff. And the few videos I've done uh, have been um, on watchmaking have been somewhat popular, but not that popular. But there's a lot of tools back here and stuff. And people have asked me what I would recommend that they get. Um, so if I had to choose between a 14060 without papers in decent condition or new Pelagos 39, uh, that is tough. Uh, it's hard for me to, people ask me sometimes about recommendations, you know, if, if I, if what I would get, and I'm a very different person and I have obviously a different collection, um, and different style as well. So for my collection, I probably would get the Pelagos 39, but I also think that's because I already have two Rolexes in there and I don't want to overweight it with Rolex because there's so many other great brands. Um, for normal people, if you don't already have a Rolex and you're considering adding one, I think there is a lot of cachet around the name and for good reason. I think that, you know, they make good, um, great quality watches down to the movement level, which I could get into in a whole, that would be a a 20 minute conversation in and of itself, but the amount of effort, attention and, and intention that they put into their design of the movements and the general design as well, I appreciate. And from a business standpoint, I appreciate them. So I also think you can't really get rid of the feeling of 
a Rolex, especially your first. The, the cachet is built into most people's brains. It was into mine. So when I first got my Explorer, there was definitely a feeling there of wearing a Rolex. And that's just going to be there for most people. And it was there for me. So if I had to pick and I didn't own a Rolex, I'd probably pick the 14060. If um, if I already had like my current collection, I'd pick the Pelagos 39. I hope that answers it quickly. Um, so from the watchmaking standpoint, uh, general things uh, that I want to cover uh, in this side over here, I have um, in my watch collection video, you guys probably saw the, um, the this doesn't have a face in it anymore, but the, the chronograph that I had, the Lejeure chronograph, I couldn't remember the name of it, but the Lejeure chronograph I have disassembled and partially put back together. Uh, it's now in this container here. But I will tell you that from a that watchmaking takes a lot of patience. Uh, this is actually a new balance wheel for the the same watch, and that's because I accidentally broke two of the balance wheels. So I already bought a replacement once, and then broke it, and this is the second one. So um, it's because the hairspring is so fragile that as you put it in, if you don't get it perfect, it it gets messed up. Uh, Sorry, I'm just reading this. So yeah, I get that. So uh, it's, if you're not reading the chat, so it says that, you know, they already have, um, this person already has a couple Rolexes and they're looking at a, a modern style Submariner. They like the Tudor quality, but from a modern sub, a modern sub can seem excessive in size and flashiness. Um, General, my, my thoughts, I think the sub size is actually, actually pretty good. Um, I know it's, it's slightly over 40.5 millimeters. So they call it a 41, but I think as soon as they trim the lugs down, even with the boxy size, I think it looks okay. I prefer the older style, like the pre maxi case Rolex case shape, but I still think the modern Rolexes don't wear overly large. As for the flashiness, I think that's going to be inherent and in, in, in any modern Rolex. You know, if, if you're not in for wanting some of that um, light reflection off the bezel and off the um, the brush finish on the bracelet, then you may be looking at just a different style diver uh, rather than a Rolex. So um, it's it's a hard itch to scratch if you're thinking about getting a Submariner. Um, I would tell you from the Pelag side, I have no itch for a Samariner anymore. That uh, if I'm going to have a dive watch, that's the one I will have, at least until they come out with something better or I buy a vintage, you know, a vintage Tudor sub, maybe mil spec would be the only uh, one that I would potentially get instead. The, uh, so is your, is your Explorer 2 still safe? I have the current reference Polar, current reference two-tone sub, fluted bezel, dial, date just 40. Also, current Sapphire Speedy and Grand Seiko. I don't know all the reference numbers off the top of my head, but I'm guessing that is, um, I'll look it up real quick. Wondering what next, if any. So what do you, I guess my question would be, what do you mean by, is the Explorer 2 still safe? Uh, if you could let me know what you mean by that. But um, wondering what next on your end, what you should consider getting. That's a pretty, again, tough question. I would I would venture into vintage a little bit, um, only because I think the feeling that's there is very different than a modern watch. I like the modern ones because I know I can wear them, use them, not think about it. Um, again, working in a warehouse every so often, you know, I don't have to think about if things get minor scratches or if um, there's some light shocks. But from a vintage standpoint, I'm obviously not going to wear them in there, but it makes it special when I do wear them because uh, I have to be careful with them. It makes it, I don't know, I'm more, I pay more attention to them. And so it's, it's kind of nice. So um, I don't know. I would, I would say venture into vintage. There's a lot of stuff in there. That's a big area to, to look at, but uh, personally, I like vintage chronographs a lot, um, especially some of the old either annual calendars, which isn't, technically always a chronograph, but old annual calendars, I think are really cool um, because they're a larger case size. So I think they still look and wear modern and then vintage. Um, 
vintage a lot of the vintage chronographs, tri compacts layouts, even some of the dual compact dual um, register layouts, I think are really cool. So I would look at those and you know, just step in a little bit. Those are not too too pricey, especially given how much your current collection is. You could probably easily get something like that. Try it out. They'll feel light. They will feel light, and potentially that's going to feel a little cheap to you, uh, based on how most of the things that you have are are heavy and and you know beefy modern watches. But I think you'll have a different experience. I think that might be fun. So, um, general stuff here um, on the watchmaking tool end. Uh, this is another watch I'll end up showing you once I finish um, fixing it, and that is a, a vintage Seamaster. I bought it um, where it said it was supposed to need repair. And uh, I do not, there it is. That's the general case. I don't, you can't obviously tell anything about it just by seeing the case, but the back should give you an idea of what you should expect on the dial. I have the dial face also stored away over here as well. It's this guy. So just a date, um, Seamaster. I think they are really cool. I think I kind of skipped over that. Most people go through a vintage Seamaster piece of their collecting journey, and I did not do that. So I thought I would repair one, wear it around for a little while, uh, get a little idea of, of how they're built. Um, everything's copper base. I've got the mainspring out here. I already bought a new mainspring for it because that mainspring is shot. And so, um, and then some of the other tools. The, uh, yeah. I would second uh, Fran's suggestion about some of the things to, to venture into. I would agree that if you're going to go into vintage, you probably are going to step into uh, some of the neo vintage first, unless you're planning on fixing it. I think that you're probably going to want to get somewhat, something that's somewhat old, but not very, very old to start and then slowly move your way backwards in time. Only because um, the further you go back, the more you're going to have issues, not just with needing repairs, but finding parts if it needs repairs. Um, things are going to be incorrect, like you're going to have the wrong case back or the wrong crystal or the wrong piece inside the movement. Whereas the more new it is, the more you can venture into vintage without having to worry about um, something being wrong or incorrect or, you know, that the whole Frankenstein watch issue that people have. So you may be better off served in the neo vintage before going to the vintage area. So, um, yeah, I do not plan on selling the Explorer two. Um, if I was, I would offer it to my brother first, but <laughs> I do not plan on uh, on selling it. I think it's it's gonna it's it's pro it is hard to let go of watches that you you kind of. Um, have experiences wearing because you kind of associate that with those experiences. Uh, it does make revolving your collection, especially when you have a YouTube channel, incredibly difficult only because then you, you never want to sell any of the watches. So imagine I've got, you know, I've got the, the two explorers, neither of which I am, I can get rid of because I have memories with them. And then when it comes to buying a new one, it's either new money or I'm getting rid of the Pelagos 39. And that's kind of the the spot I'm in right now. If I want to add anything, I have to get rid of that uh, or add new money. And, and I don't think the the add new money portion is going to be going towards the collection for the next year uh, or more. So that kind of makes it challenging. So uh, either way for this, I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to do a live video because I wanted to just kind of talk off the cuff. Uh, not that all my videos aren't already off the cuff, but talk in general give an idea of, of some of the things that I'm planning on reviewing on the channel. Uh, general concept, you can see what I'm planning to do with these videos. Obviously the, the overhead camera right there, you can see kind of what I'm considering on the watch repair end. Obviously uh, these videos take significantly longer to edit because uh, I have two cameras and I have, you know, on any watch repair, four to five hours worth of footage. Whereas most of this other stuff, I normally have like 40 minutes, 30 minutes of footage with one camera with some B-roll. So very, very different. Um, so I will make probably two videos and then see how how much people watch them. And if they don't, frankly, I'll do these repairs <laughs> without the camera because this having to duck my head to avoid the camera makes it um, 
makes the watch repair much more challenging uh, than it otherwise would be. So the uh, thanks, Vibrant Mango. Uh, so the let's see. On the Neo Vintage source that's trusted, uh, I would definitely look at eBay reviews. Someone's got a whole bunch. But um, Eric Wind is definitely a option. He would give you the correct model. Um, I met him at a Moyer event last year, and he knows his stuff. He, he seems like um, more uh nerdy about watches than i am obviously if you've watched any videos of eric wind you'd know what i meant and i think i'm pretty nerdy and i definitely was on the nerdier end of people that were there as i was trying to talk to them about some of the stuff i was doing here but the uh but he would definitely get it correct he's definitely gonna be more expensive though he, he charges a premium for making sure that it's correct and they're usually um good examples too his stuff is not usually polished it's usually some of the best examples he can find so definitely if you're looking at that, those are good options. There's a lot of other really good um, options out there as well. Um, but I buy most of my stuff on eBay, frankly. Um, but I also tend to open it up as soon as I get it. So I'm in a different area. Uh, how long have I been tinkering around with watches? Honestly, not that long. Um, so I started, I started like kind of half doing it, like regulating watches um, like two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, something like that. I, um, my brother and I bought my dad a watch and when we did, it was an Oris and we did, it was actually like, it was, I think minus six seconds a day or something like that. And I regulated that, but regulation is really easy. So I don't know if, I mean, for most watches, it's really easy for something like uh, a Rolex or an Omega with a free, free sprung balance. It's much more complicated, but for most watches, regulation is really easy. You could easily do it yourself with like three tools. So that's, that's not much, but in terms of this stuff, like the disassembling, reassembling, um, about nine months, I guess now, um, I started watching wristwatch revival and I had already watched watch repair channel. I think that's correct. Um, like a year and a half ago, I started watching some of those. Then I was interested. I have a, I like mechanical things, engineering, how they work, how they function, how they're built. So I'm, I'm mechanically minded. So I like learning and disassembling and breaking things apart. When I was a kid, I used to just break things just to see how they worked um, or just to break them. I'm not entirely sure you'd have to ask my mother, but the, um, this stuff here, I started doing that about nine months ago. I started with uh, Chinese movements. If you're going to tinker with watches, that's definitely what I would recommend because they're inexpensive. They're inexpensive. And if you make a mistake, you're, you know, it's not that big a deal. You just buy, these are like, they're Chinese clones of base caliber manual, manual wound ETA movements. Excuse me, no dial, uh, no case. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Just get the movement. Because this, if you buy, start getting into pocket watches, the issue is if you make a mistake, you know, you feel bad because <laughs> I did that. You have, you know, a piece of history that you've accidentally damaged. So I would definitely get, um, definitely get something that's cheap and you're not worried about breaking. And then I bought two actually, uh, just in case, just in case I broke one or made a mistake on one, I had a replacement part already with me. So I would get two and then I would disassemble this, put it back together. And then same thing on this one. And then once you do that, then I would start doing the more complicated stuff like the, these jewels right here, uh, the cap jewels over the balance wheel. Those are pain. If you don't get good at at, uh, at holding tweezers, those things can flip away from you and you're never going to find it, especially if you're on top of carpet. So just keep that in mind. Um, but I would definitely start with those if you're interested. So um, yeah, I, uh, I do... I, I try and do most of my stuff off the cuff um, just because I think that's kind of the point of talking about watches is to talk about them, to say, this is what I think, this is what I feel. Granted, some of those times um, people might not like what you say, but I, I don't like to mince my words. So I'll tell you what I think. 
And I think the watch repair stuff has a lot. I started doing it originally because of the channel, because I was interested in, in describing some of the things that people think are true about watch movements, especially in-house movements. And I wanted to kind of explain from a mechanical standpoint, what are the differences actually in the movements between one company to another? Um, I don't know if I will be able to do it perfectly, but I think I'll be able to answer general questions. At least that's my hope. Um, and then in terms of like finding a local group of, of people to talk about watches uh, and that you, you trust um, is, is tough. I think that um, there are obviously, there are supposed to be red bar meetings. I've never gone to one of those. But there's supposed to be red bar meetings in Indianapolis. And uh, I know they're somewhat popular, but I have never gone. I've always, when, especially when you first get into this stuff, it always feels like um, you always, at least I did, felt self, self-conscious, you know, going to a meeting of all these people. And I had, um, at the time, I think when I first heard about a red bar meeting, I only had a Hamilton Khaki King and that was it. That was the only watch I had. I spent 300 bucks on it and it felt like I spent a fortune and uh, I think that that is it's tough to go to one of those meetings and just be like, hey, this is my $300 watch. And everyone's bringing out all these things you've seen on YouTube and, you know, are obviously expensive. And so I don't know. I would say if you're if you are someone, I'm also not someone that would uh, I don't typically go to very many things other than work and obviously being with my wife. So um, I don't know if I'd go to very many of those things, but I think as, as some of this stuff gets rolling and I do the channel a little bit more, I think I'll be going to a few more of those things. So hopefully I can make people feel comfortable that are there if I do end up meeting you there. Um, yeah. So yes, uh, if you're interested in watch repair, so this person saying in the chat, Kyle Weiss, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, wristwatch revival is fantastic. I mean, he obviously gets a whole lot of people, um, into watch repair, I think, cause he has first off great voice, great narration. He tells a story as he goes through it. He makes it semi-dramatic if he, you know, finds something that's wrong inside the watch, which, you know, he just does a really good job narrating it. And he's got great sim like, uh, imagery. So he's got good photography or videography, um, which makes it appealing. If you're going to start doing the watch repair stuff, and I, I think you should, um, just know that as you start getting into it, uh, I don't know if you've gotten into a mechanical hobby before, but tools are a never ending pursuit. You will never have all of the tools that you actually need or want until you've put a fortune into it. So just keep that in mind. This hobby, uh, it expands very quickly. So like, I don't know if you can see it. That That is a obviously the microscope, but this is a watch cleaning machine. Um, this was, you know, something I didn't think I was going to get, but an ultrasonic cleaner is a pain in the butt to actually clean all of the parts. So that I didn't think I was going to get and got. I started with a couple tweezers and a screwdriver set, then the mat, and then the time grapher, and then eventually now... If you're going to not buy mainsprings for every single watch and some watches, um, unless you've got a, uh, where is it? There's a tool that allows you to basically, it's a micrometer, I believe if I'm saying that correctly, that allows you to measure the height, width, and length, although the length isn't true on the micrometer, of a mainspring. Finding exactly what this is supposed to be, which exact mainspring this is supposed to be can be challenging. Um unless it's a well-known caliber. So look at if you can find parts before you buy the watch, but then also know if you're going to get into watch repair, you're going to at least spend $1,500 to $2,000 just to get the base tools. And then, you know, then you're actually set up to service a watch from start to finish. So breaking them apart and, and, and tinkering with them is the start. Figure out if you like it and you don't want to, you know, you, you don't get too frustrated. And then after that, I would, I would, then decide if it's worth continuing and then just keep adding stuff and learning more. It's fun. I love it. Um, it definitely takes time, but I do enjoy it. And um, I learn a lot, which I really like seeing how people solve the same problem in different ways, which is really fun. Um, thanks for, yeah, this is. So uh, I have not thought about branching into polishing or relooming. 
uh, or bracelet repair, like polishing kind of. Um, I've actually bought a couple things. These are all, these are all different methods I had read online about uh, refinishing titanium. And so I wanted to see if any of these are true because I did the video a while back about uh, my Tudor Pelagos having scratches on it. And people were like, oh, well, you know, it's super easy though. You just get like an ink eraser and you're done. It'll get rid of the scratches. So um, I'm not obviously gonna erase the whole thing. I'm gonna start with one link with each of these and see which one provides the best. This is like, um, this is a scratch brush, a fiberglass pen, essentially. This was supposed to be also amazing. And then obviously I've got a Dremel tool wheel set. This is probably gonna be the best, but I wanna see what does that look like. Um, I don't think I'll get good at actually polishing, you know, all the time, at least not for a few years. My main goal right now is to just figure out if I can take a watch part uh, correctly, oil it correctly and put it back together correctly, and then branch into the polishing part. But I have considered some of that, especially on the titanium end. Um, best and worst part of working in a warehouse, the G-Shock, uh, guessing a G-Shock for some kind uh, of some kind for work duty. Um, so I, I originally um, worked uh, for Amazon in a warehouse. And in that case, I wore originally an Apple watch because that's the watch that I had for most of college and after college. Um, so I wore that and then I ended up moving from that to actually an Orient Bambino. And I used to wear the Orient Bambino into Amazon, into the warehouse. Um, and it got scratched up. Um, and then after I got rid of it, then I um, started wearing a G-Shock every single day, especially if I was pulling pallets or something like that. I'd usually switch actually out of the Orient and into the G-Shock, but either way. So we're G-Shock most of the time. And then when I was building construction, always a G-Shock, you, you don't wear anything other than that typically on the job site. Nowadays, I try a Seiko turtle, but I know that I'm, I really don't need to be wearing it. It's mainly just a me thing. I think it's fun. So I like to wear a Seiko turtle now when I'm building. The rest of the warehouse work, frankly, I don't do a huge amount of the um, hands-on that would that would concern me for scratching the watch. So like if we cut something uh, or we're drilling something or um, unloading a trailer with a forklift, all that stuff, typically my hands aren't close enough to have to worry about scratching anything. There's a few examples, some of the drilling stuff, some of that or pallet building that's where it starts to get a little finicky. Um, but I actually do a decent amount of work also in the office just because um, while I am in a warehouse a lot of the time and help run the warehouse, uh, technically, because my family and I own the company, I'm not always physically back there. Um, but when I'm back there nowadays, typically I'll either wear what I'm wearing or I'll swap into my Seiko Turtle or I'm trying to wear my Hamilton Khaki mechanical back there now only because if I don't wear it back there, I will probably sell it. Um, if I'm comfortable discussing Amazon warehouse conditions, overblown or accurate, um, it depends on the building. Um, so I, I really enjoyed my time at Amazon. Um, I wasn't a worker though. So I, uh, I was hired as an area manager, which is like you oversee, I don't know, um, typically anywhere between 50, I guess 30, in between 30 to 50, 60 people and um, try and get them to do what Amazon wants them to do essentially for their job. So uh, hold them to the requirements, watch, you know, you're their manager. So all of what that entails. And so I wasn't physically doing the job all the time. I did have to pull pallets 60% of the time uh, only because that would keep everything running. I think that the Amazon work conditions that I experienced were actually pretty good. Um, it gets hot on the fourth floor just because heat rises. Other than that, like my buildings were very nice, very, very nice and, and designed to make the associates happy. So I didn't have some of the warehouse horror stories are generally for the legacy buildings, the ones before the robotics where everyone had to walk through aisles and they obviously they get people to click. So they find the worst stories they can find. Um, so I was never in one of those buildings, so I wouldn't be able to talk about exactly how bad those situations get. But from what I saw, Amazon was very, very careful to make sure that everyone had a good experience working there for the most part. Um, 
Do I source watch parts on eBay as well? Imagine that being difficult to find the right ones. Yes, sometimes. So I just bought a, um, the mainspring actually for the Omega is from eBay. That's where I actually bought it from, as well as um, this balance wheel. So the balance wheel for the 7750 is from eBay. I didn't buy it from, from Cousins. I typically buy most of the watch parts from Cousins UK, their wholesale watch parts supplier. And they do great work. Um, I mean, they have good prices and and they get things to me and it's the genuine parts and everything's great. The downside, obviously, to um, to buying from Cousins is because I'm in the United States, I have to pay a lot for shipping. Either I buy it where the shipping's inexpensive through Royal Mail and then it takes forever to get to me or I pay a bunch to get UPS to ship it. Um, and then the other problem is the pound to U.S. conversion rate. So sometimes places like Cast Care. Um, C-A-S-C-E-R, I think I'm saying that correct, or Auto Fray are better, or Esslinger for that example. Those three in the States are all Midwest focused uh, or Midwest based. And that's where I'll buy most of the parts if I'm not going to get it from eBay or Cousins. But most of my stuff has been from Cousins. Uh, they just, I'll buy it in a huge batch. So I get like, I don't know, as much as, as many tools as I'm willing to pay for it at that time, all at once from them. And then also that watch repair machine came from eBay as well. So I didn't buy that um, from anyone specifically. Obviously, it's an old tool. So I found one that said they said it was working and that it was squeaky. And so then I had to tighten a couple, you know, a couple of the, the screws on the spacers and then oil the, the motor and it worked just fine. So. Um, so that's pretty much it. I mean, that's generally what I wanted to cover. I didn't have a huge list. I wanted to kind of just throw it out there, talk briefly, do a live stream. Um, I hadn't done one of these before. So I wanted to to basically just, um, I thought it was, a, it was a good opportunity to kind of talk through uh, what my plans were for the channel, uh, what my plans were for watchmaking, answer any questions, um, because I'll probably be doing these live streams a little more often, maybe every, every other week, only because some videos like the watchmaking um, videos, the finer details, the questions, the off questions people ask, I can't make a full video about it. You know, each video takes me five hours to make. And so I want to make sure that uh, I want to make sure that I answer the question, but not I, I don't have enough time to make enough videos to answer all of them. So that's kind of what I figured on the live stream. Don't want to make it too long. Thanks everyone for showing up and kind of chatting um, for a little while, asking some questions. If you guys have any other questions or you want to talk to me or whatever, I'm typically always available. I mean, I, I'm almost always willing to answer people's questions um, unless you're rude. I'll probably always answer. Uh, you can obviously leave comments in this. Uh, I think, I don't know how live streams work, but you might be able to leave comments in this. If you can't, uh, you can also just message me on Instagram. That's the best way to reach me. Uh, I'm almost always responding to people there. People ask about questions, advice, watch tools, whatever. Happy to answer that. Um, and that's at wrist underscore swap. That's my Instagram. So if you meet me over there, then you can, you know, send me whatever questions you have or, or chat with me for a little while. Um, and then other than that, I will see everyone in the next live stream. Uh, I plan on releasing a video later this week where I'm going to be talking through, uh, I believe my plan for this week is to talk through uh, the moon swatch and how I feel about it. Um, it's a couple shots. I've been wearing it for a little while and I, I like it more than I expected. But either way, I'll talk more about that then and then I'll do a live stream. I'll let you guys know when I plan on doing a live stream, probably in a couple weeks. So till then, I'll see you guys in a little while. Take care, guys.